All right, it is May 8th, and it is a brand new episode of Let There Be Talk, number 696. Today, we have got a massive, amazing guest, somebody that uh, means the world to me. The four string, sometimes six string, maybe eight string God, Mr. Jason Newstead. And I want to tell you this right now at the beginning of the show, before you kind of drift off into your ADD world, Jason has fired up his band Newstead again, and they're playing one night, May 20th, at Revolution Live in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So do whatever you got to do to get out there and see this special event, 10-year anniversary of Newstead. Get a Southwest flight or Spirit Air or take a Greyhound, hitchhike. Remember hitchhiking? Hitchhike across America and hope the Night Stalker didn't pick you up. Get out there and see him live. But in the meantime, I'm going to tell you this. I've done, you know, what, 696 episodes, and it's been 11 years. And my goal is to get all of the Metallica guys, not because, ooh, they're big stars or whatever, but because of what they mean to me. And the love I have for these guys, especially, you know, of course, I love the Cliff Burton era. That's an obvious no-brainer. Everybody loves that. But for me, really, when my world changes is the Justice record and the Black Album and those tours and what that band did and what they went through and the hundreds of dates and the three, four years on the road playing some of the most insane metal for two or two and a half hours, dealing with all kinds of insanity in that era of giant rock and roll and metal. Just unreal what these guys have accomplished. And I've said it over and over, they are my favorite band. I will go to the grave with that. And mostly the inspiration that I get from them, their work ethic and what they did, their fans, their crowd, every, everything, everything about it, their crew, the people that work for them, Q Prime, it's all fucking good. And to sit down with Jason after all these years and go over some old school stories was just incredible. I want to thank Bill Burr for giving my phone number to Jason. Don't give that number out, Jason, to anybody. It's private. <laughs> oh, man. I'm in a good mood today because I listened to this episode all last night as I was tightening it up and editing it and getting it ready for you guys. And I was just blown away by how great this man is. He was the, uh, the link between the mystique of Metallica and the fans, that, that barrier. He would go over the barrier. Shake hands, give out picks, talk, sign autographs, go the extra mile. They all do that, actually. But just Jason was the man. And uh, it's just great to see him still alive out there just killing it. You know, painting, great art, making music, challenging himself still at 60 years old, not sitting around. You know, throwing up flyers, former Metallica bass player, living on that. Nah, the guy is legit, always has been the real deal. Going to get into it in a minute here, but before I do, I want to tell you, this episode is brought to you by my sponsor, Standard and Strange, the one-stop denim shop. You need denim, leather, boots, uh, flannels, cool shit. Go to Standard and Strange in Berkeley, New York, or New Mexico. Tell them I sent you. Ask for Jeremy or Neil. This is where I get all of my clothing. Real McCoy's leathers, Momotaro uh, denim, John Lofgren boots. They got it all. I absolutely love both these humans. They are the real deal. I dig it. Standardandstrange.com or go to their Instagram. Check out all of their stuff. Also, if you have a beautiful dog that you love, don't feed it garbage. Migos dog. That's what you need to be giving your dog so they live a long, healthy life. If you live in Los Angeles, MigosDog.com is now delivering to your doorstep. 
Human grade food made right in Malibu, California. You can get it at Healthy Spot or Air One. My dog Gertrude, Gertie, loves the salmon. And sometimes she uh, parties a little uh, duck. MigosDog.com. Follow him on Instagram. Also tell him I sent you. Patreon.com slash Dean Delray uh, has a brand new bonus episode up. And I think it's number 131. So if you want bonus Let There Be Talks, support the podcast. Go to the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Dean Delray. And uh, also I Zoom, I live Zoom with all of the uh, Patreoners. One last thing, tour dates, deandelray.com. I will be in Alameda two nights in June and Santa Rosa. So going up to a little NorCal run. And uh, also Lincoln, California, two nights with Mr. Bill Burr. The Alameda shows and Santa Rosa shows I'm headlining. In the meantime, other than that, you can catch me all the time at the world-famous comedy store. I love you guys. Got to keep the candles lit. Once again, go see Newstead, May 20th at Revolution Live in Fort Lauderdale, California. Thank you, Jason, for doing the show. Fantastic episode. Hope everybody has a great week. And uh, yeah, man, I guess that's about it. The candles are lit. Right here, Mr. Jason Newstead. Now, that, you got a mid-century there? This place was uh, 1958. And where are you? Uh, Jupiter Island, Florida. Wow, you live in Florida now? Uh, just, you know, in the, in the winter. In the winter. And then where are you in the summer? Upstate. Upstate. No, no more West Coast. Or, or I mean, it's interesting with you because uh, I've followed your real estate uh portfolio over the years I, I think you had a place in montana right yeah and then uh were you in walnut creek for years right the original chop house was in walnut creek that's correct and now all of that's gone and you're on the east coast or florida and new york yeah my wife's family is from upstate and so that's kind of where we ended up man how do you like it it's wonderful and who, who's the architect on your house? Oh, man. Uh, a couple different guys, actually. I, it's, it was a while before me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, here we are. This is a, a long time coming. And I want to thank Mr. Bill Burr for uh, somehow putting it together. But this is Jason Newstead here on Let There Be Talk today. Awesome. How are you, buddy? I'm really intrigued of where you're going to take me and what you're going to remind me of, man, because I've had some couple of people come to me in the last couple of days. I told them I was going to come and do this. And I was jamming with my boys today, you know, and the one guy, uh, a couple of the guys had played in Jet Boy back in the day. And so there was some affiliation with you with them somehow, or a couple of the guys used to play in a band or something. And so I'm just trying, I was getting some history on you and stuff so I could see where I was. But then you told me in a, um, a recent email or text that you were there the night I joined Metallica. Is that true? Or one of the nights? Yeah. Let me ask you if you remember this. So this is how I remember it. So uh, I guess you go to Tommy's joint. They say you're in the band. And then about a couple hours later, I happened to be at this fundraiser that Faith No More was playing at Wolfgang's. Do you remember this? Holy crap. Wow. Huh. I'm trying to remember exactly how it went, but they played a fundraiser and Metallica walks in, some of the guys, and you're standing next to me. And I said, hey, what's going on? And you said, I think I'm the new bass player for Metallica. Wow. And I said, is that right? And that's what I remember now. <laughs> I know it's wow. like years ago. I remember the Faith No More thing. I remember Wolfgang's. I remember the... I those couple of nights as we were doing the rehearsals and kind of getting the, what do you call it? The okay from the, the elders. Um, Lars's dad was there and both Burton's were alive then. And um, Torben. Uh, yeah. It was, uh, and so we played and they knew that I'd already been chosen, you know, so it was right amongst those 30 or 40 hours. And it was such a surreal spitting blurry oh my god type of thing so you remember a little better than me but 
that's crazy. The timing and the whole thing like that. That's amazing to me. That's that we have that deeper roots. It's crazy. It, it's pretty wild too, because it was a, kind of a Forrest Gump moment for me, you know, just kind of <laughs> like, Oh wow, I was there. And then, and then as the years go by over years and years, you start to think like, was I there or was I, there? but I remember it, man, because I, I just remember you were standing next to me and I was like, Oh man, that's pretty wild. And then I just walked away and I, I talked to my buddy. I go, hey, Jason says he's in Metallica now because this is pre-internet or anything. Nobody knew what was going on. Nobody even knew who they were rehearsing with or trying out. No. Wow. Yep. I remember it because Faith No More was some of the first people that I really got in with. Um, the Martin family, Jim and his brother, Lawrence, and the whole family because they were all their folks were still alive and everything then too. Um so they embraced me right away. That was actually the first group that did embrace me were Cliff's closest friends. So that was really uh, important, very important to me, vital actually at the time. It was funny because at the time, my band was uh, rehearsing at Hun Sound and you guys kind of moved your stuff in there to rehearse, but then you went on tour and you were never around again. So we had our, right. we had the studio to ourselves the whole time because you guys were gone all the time. Wow. I, re I remember that too. That was the earliest. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Wow, dude. She's breaking away some layers here. Holy crap. Absolutely. It's a good place to launch from. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, uh, it's funny because um, I've been around the Metallica camp for, I don't know, what are we on? F 42 years now. So I would say probably 41 years. And I used to book the stone, had Flotsam at the stone. And uh, I was the uh, talent booker there when I was a kid. I love it. I love it, dude. I love it. It's fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. And we're still alive. <laughs> oh, I, I can't believe that part. I will tell you this. this uh, we can jump all around, but there's just one great story I want to include my mom in because she was a big Metallica fan, and uh, which is crazy. She wasn't like some... Uh, trash woman like uh, yeah i go metal she just liked all different types of music and during the black album uh i you had hooked me up quite a bit actually your tech uh what was his name adam or something Z well uh, uh aiden was aiden the initial guy and yep. then zach but aiden was very first yeah aiden and now he's with um with def leppard but then zach and 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 he hooked my mom up with snake pit tickets in Albuquerque, New Mexico. <laughs> my mom was like, I'm inside the stage. It's crazy. Right, yeah. 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 Man, I can relate. My dad did that too. And um my dad was this kind of cat that would wear, you know, bright colored sweaters to the show. And he'd bring his friends from Clark Equipment Company and like, look at my boy, you know, that type of trip. Uh and just stand in the in the snake pit with two sets of earplugs just slammed into his ears, just explosions going off and shit. He'd elbow his friends when it was time to watch out for a concussion bomb. He knew what was coming, you know? So I can relate big time, man. I remember his face on a few of those. So great. great. So great, great, man. I think my great, mom brought man. someone from work, you know? There you have it. There you have it. You want to see, you want to see something you ain't seen before? Come on. Yeah. Unbelievable. Great. Unbelievable. Great. 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 I mean, you know, most people uh, that are any kind of Metallica fans, they know the history. They know what went down. They know how you join. They know how uh, it, you quit, all of that. But I just thought it would be cool to really talk about some of my memories and ask you about them, um, specifically some of the key shows that really blew my mind. Of course, we know you join, you do the country club, uh, first kind of live gig, and then you're off and running and boom, you're in fucking Metallica. Pretty wild, you know? Uh, we know about the years of hazing and the craziness and the insanity of that. And most people that listen to this show know that, of course, I love Master of Puppets. I know it's a masterpiece. It's the obvious masterpiece. But to me, I think the greatest record ever made for metal would be Justice for All. And uh, yeah, I think I think the reason I love it so much is there was a big core of thrash metal in the Bay Area with Testament, Death Angel, Exodus, Metallica, Forbidden, Possessed. But to get into when Justice drops, it's so fucking different than anything ever made. I wanted to talk to you about that. Of course, we don't need to talk 
talk about the bass tone. It's not there. There's no bass. But I do want to talk about once you're in, you do the the Aussie tour, the garage days, and then you guys buckle down and start working on Justice. Were you blown away about what was happening with the songwriting and the the arrangements and how how much depth was in this material compared to uh, Masters? Uh, let's see. So since I wasn't involved in recording Master, I certainly spent plenty of time learning the songs, but the answers to the quiz were already there, right? So I just had to memorize things. Um, and I definitely learned most Metallica songs long before I ever met them as people. Um, but I didn't know how their process of recording would go. I only knew how my process of recording would go and had gone with Flotsam and Jetsam. And the and Justice for All style, tempos, changes, complexities, all those things, not too far from Flotsam, man. You know, I mean, it, ba- it basically was in stride for me when it comes down to it, that quickness and the state start and stop and the double, you know, as the rhythm section doing that thing, that was, that's really kind of, I was already there. And, uh, you know, it's pretty amazing what has taken place with this particular record and, uh, and justice for all. Um, it sold so much to begin with, you know, like right out of the gate, it was just amazing because the anticipation was so great. Uh, so that was fantastic. That was already in our favor very much. And those guys had already done so much hard work around the world at least about 22 or 24 countries that they really had worked hard in to get a a following, a lot of hard work. And so that was already done. And I wasn't there for any of that. So when I stepped in, we were prepared to launch. They were prepared to launch. I came in as a new heart, lungs and so forth and uh, let it rip, you know. So the recording process and all that was no different than anything I had ever done in Flotsam. A couple of days worth. I did my tracks. I'm done. See you later load my own gear into my truck and back out again. And here we go. You know, same shit every four the other albums with same stuff I played on justice it was no different, no different process or that the frequencies were coming in weird or anything like that. Um, that was all in stride for me. And now that the time has passed and we still even talk about it in this way. And the point that you're making exactly, if it would have been like the other, those other pioneers and second stage of pioneers that you mentioned, uh, if it was the same mix and the same thing, the same approach, you know, what then? Um, there was never any big bass on Metallica's albums until the Black Album. There was audible bass of From the Bell Tolls, solos, obviously, Call of Cthulhu, Orion. These things were up there where there was lead bass, but as far as the body and the depth and the girth of the bass frequencies, they didn't exist in metallic albums other than the bass drum until the Black Album. You know, there were actually Garage Days re revisited, there was some throbbing bass. And that's kind of what I was going on. Like, that's what we recorded. So that's what this was going to be. I can hand it over to these guys to mix it. I don't have to be there, you know. But the other, I mean, all the flots and recordings of all the time, of course, I was at the helm. And I got in this guy's, I'd step back, find my role on that thing. But if I knew that I should have hung around and played part of that role too and did my own mixing and shit, I would have. But it was their their trip, you know. Um, I was still kind of trying to find my place. The incredible thing now, 30, what are we, 35 or 36 years since uh, I just for all, the, the best garage duo ever. You know, like White Stripes could barely tie these guys' shoes. No disrespect to White Stripes or Black Keys or do ex- you know, who's that bus? So what is that? Duo Jets, those guys early, early on, just two piece. Um, this is what always happened in Metallica. There's two people. They go into a room, usually as small as possible, like a fucking cave, right? And there's still stacks of marshals in that cave, even though literally it's 70 or 80 square feet. I mean, and a drum set and a couple of Marshall stacks and the old Tascam cassette recorder eight track. Yes. What they were speaking of master. They were very good at this thing. The demos that they produced just from that little machine were insane. So it was always that sound. That was the sound of the band. Look at the original, original, original photographs where it's just Lars with his drum kit and James. And they're both hanging on the flying V. It was them. That's always been the sound of the band. And two other guys over here compliment, embellish, whatever you want to call it. 
you know, so that actually was just the next extension of that, those two guys doing that thing. And they had to make sure it would, you know, I mean, that think about the confusion and the holy shit that's going on in their heads. And, you know, we're talking about living in a band with full blown alcoholics, man. I mean, it's, you know, there's a, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it, but we did good at still making our way and, and working hard. But my, my take on it now as a fan first, then in the band now out again and trying to get the fans perspective, step out of myself, best garage duo ever, best garage duo album ever. I agree. I agree. And I, um, I'm never a fan of any of my favorite records going way back way. Uh, I'm never a fan of changing the history of something by let's add bass into it now. And, you know, once they release the box set, people are like, where's the bass? It's like, quit, you know, quit talking about that and just take in the magnitude of this goddamn record. They lost a member. They get a new member. They go out and tour with Ozzy. They come in and they record one of the most insane metal records ever made. And still to this day, that's it, it just shadows how great the songs and how insane this thing was for these guys, the direction they took and the risks they took instead of just yeah. being a standard thrash metal band. Here's something for you, you know? There are so many elements involved, and some of them I talked about, but not to you. So um, if you think about what was going on right then, okay, just exactly those months, we'd been asked to join Scorpions and Van Halen for the Monsters of Rock, and the first time we'd go around America as that in 30 cities or something, not just one in New York and one in Los Angeles, but actually taking the, the whole, that giant thing around. Second on the bill after Kingdom Come, before docking, right? And let's see, we were all 25, you know? Um, what goes on then when the literally the world is your oyster? Literally. And it's all, I mean, the trajectory is like that already. And everybody knows. And the people that we're playing with, Van Halen, Scorpions, guys showing mad respect. They see, they see how the people react to us. You know what I mean? And there's, they know enough, man. They've been around enough what it takes to make that happen. You know, so they show respect to us in that way. So you just think about what would take place in that year. What was happening right then? Who was doing what with Doc Scorpions, Ben Halen? Piles of the product everywhere. I mean, crazy. Whoa! The whole time. And trying to just do shows on the weekend, have all those days off in the middle. The Beast would travel around and have that be set up on that Friday, have a second setup at home. The guys would take that next to the next city while well, finished from that one. And they revolve like that because it's sitting up a freaking city, you know? So amongst all of that, think it we're all new to it at this level, certainly. And and the level we haven't reached yet, Scorpions and Van Halen, we're allowing us to hang with them. I level lie, not like this no more, you know? So all of that, all of that at once, and the exhaustion always having to be on, 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 on all the time. And the travel and the vibe and the you know, and you didn't need any stimulants, but they were all over the place. Your adrenaline and natural sleep deprivation, everything would already had just so wired and freaking zzz. anyway, just vibrating and shit. It just was. So start there. Start there as the playing field that you're on. And then those guys bopping back and forth, trying to go to Bearsville in New York in between if we're playing Albuquerque or Kansas City or whatever. And they still got to make it back for the shows and go up and mix out of their heads. Think about the things I've just talked about. That all was very present, you know, all the time it was perpetual. Okay. So within all of that, they're trying to keep their heads on. They're trying to express themselves. All this anger, grief, and all that shit. Don't know where to put it. So I'll put it here and I'll put it here. What the fuck, you know, a lot, a lot going on, bro. A lot. What's great about you is you got to work with Fleming and you got to work with Bob Rock back to back. So you can really, because I, I, I talked to Kurt about it a couple of years ago and I thought, have you ever thought of working with Fleming again? Why, you know, with the success that was happening of these records, why did they never, ever, uh, you know, take a trip down that road again? But you got to work with both. And we know Bob Rock and we know how different it was just hours and hours and years, you know, of making the Black Album. But what else do you think was different besides Fleming and Bob Rock? The studio, the money, uh, the time. What do you think? Um, some of the same things that I spoke about a moment ago, 
when Fleming was there to make the other records in Denmark. Yeah. And then it's time for to, to make a, a record in America, trying to get that next leg up, maybe hit that next plateau. And powers that be that came into play, management and or record companies, and certainly more dough and opportunities and things like this. And people will only show interest in you if they know they can make some money off you. So there's a lot of that happening. That is real right there, what you just said. Yeah. So so between that, you know, like the, that they would have maybe wanted to have Fleming come over, but but there's somebody over here going, do you guys want to make, you're right on the fucking precipice. Do you want to make that jump over the chasm and land on the other side to that tall mountain in order to make that jump you're probably going to be scat and they probably need to do this and this and it actually dude from what i remember what little i remember little time that i even spent there really like what i talked about before i had my old ford ranger truck still i didn't have i didn't even spend money on a new car yet because we weren't ever freaking home i didn't drive anywhere i didn't need anything people were driving us everywhere i still had my own truck that i brought from flotsam days my same truck you know and i drove down from san francisco and had my amp in the back, and I loaded it in, loaded it out. It was just the same. And all I remember is the confusion of the producers. Who the fuck is going to do this? They bring in Mike Clink, and they bring in this cat. But I, well, he did so and so, and he did a. You know, he has that fancy award, and this one did that. And I'm like, what about somebody who knows who the fuck we are? How about that type of thing? Can we just not because he has those accolades and that band was successful with his stamp on it? Because that's not what's going to happen. He ain't going to come in and go, here's how I do shit. No, <laughs> you know, you got to have somebody that understands that no, we'll, these are the guys that will be calling the shots. You'll be making percentage. Okay. And remember that. So be paying attention. We'll learn from you. You learn from us. If it works out right. I don't remember that working in that album's recording sessions a little bit that I had. I remember that flourishing with Bob Rock. Okay. Like fucking giant blossoms everywhere. But I do not remember that. I remember just for all being chaotic, being confused. I recorded my stuff with Toby Wright, who was at that time the assistant engineer, went on to make, you know, Alice in Chains and all kind of cool shit. One of very good, solid fucking guy. One of the first guys that really showed me how to do stuff on a desk and all. But there wasn't the producer in the room or Fleming in the room with me or any of that. You know, that was kind of on the fringes for me. Wow. Wow. It, it, it also is the, at this time where I, I call, uh, the mighty Headfield. Headfield changes from a uh, kind of uh if you I've seen them from you know the first year all the way out. But you know, in those early stone days and lightning days and masters, where he's like, come on, motherfuckers, yeah. And then he turns into this kind of like Ted Nugent meets Danzig, you know? It's just this fucking yeah, yeah, yeah you know, and it's like it's the most insane. Front man, I've ever seen. People ask me who's the most insane, you know, and I'm like, well, I saw Bon Scott, but uh, I, you know, I got to tell you, it's got to be Hetfield during the Justice Through the Black album tour. There's nothing more insane than that, and you can watch it over and over on YouTube. So that had to be interesting to see that guy change like that. That transformation, but I hadn't heard, I hadn't heard that combination yet. So that's a great visual, man. And it's pretty accurate when you think about it. Even just visually, it's pretty accurate. Yeah. Yep. I mean, not on the persona, but the, char the character of the shit. Maybe with some Ronnie Van Sant also. Well, and I, and I was thinking a little bit of Cowardly Lion. You know, like you throw a little bit in and it's got that little thing. And it's just that because there's always a little bit of tongue in cheek. He has such a great sense of humor. There's always that thing, you know, that always, man, always. He still does. He's very witty. Um, but, you know, um, Jägermeister, bro. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. But also it had to be some kind of uh, other than liquid courage. It had to be some kind of also uh, pissed off at the world, you know? Yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of messing, but um, I don't think that James will probably ever recover from the cliff thing because of his um, abandonment and separation, things that happened to him with his family and stuff were so far beyond his control. This is the kind of shit that cuts so deep, you know, no matter how many people you talk it through with, it's still going to be there. So within all of that, he had to find a way to compartmentalize, you know. There's a thing I've learned over these past years, the respect that I've always had great respect for the guy, but even more so now, there was never a time I didn't respect his ability to harness and or process and field Everything that comes at him, uh, what he's able to do with the crowd, there's only a handful. You named a couple of them in our conversation already. 
uh, where you ha- could have 50, 60, what's whatever the number is, 60, 70,000 people right here the whole time, as long as he wants to, and then push him away and bring him back. I mean, incredible shit. So it's still just flesh and bone, okay? It's still just a person. And a troubled person that's had these all these things that still rise above and rise above and get torched and break my arm and rise above, break my arm again and rise above. You know, keep on coming. What you're made of, dude. Come on, how many times you get back up? We've heard it a million times, but this is fucking real. This is real. How many times you get back and still leads us, you know, and leads those guys today and all this time. How many ever 40 whatever years later, right? There's certain toughness, toughness, handling adversity that comes from handling adversity, you know, and he's got that. So he has the capacity to anything he wants to get you know, like that and to have everybody right where he wants them. But his real person is still this cat that just wants to chill, you know, just like you and me love, love our dog, love our family, all cool, like that kind of thing. Love the outdoors, you know, thankful for things, grateful for things, but you still got to play that persona. People are expecting this from you. This is a big load for a human being, for one person, you know? So I realized that as I was with him a little bit, it would always, you know, Kirk and Lars were in one dressing room and James and I were in the other. That's how it always was. And my mom embraced him. My family embraced him. It was all that thing. He was that, he was my brother like that. So I always tried to be there for him like that. You know what I'm saying? But sort of see him, I didn't know him yet. He didn't let me know him yet in those years. I could only be support on the stage and support when he asked me to be that, you know, that's it. So seeing the transformation, I still was, I always will be that person looking for listening to master puppets, right? The lightning is my first in you know, my favorite album and all these things, having the opportunity to stand there with them and hold my ground for 15 years, no matter what they threw at me. Okay. So I'm hoping to earn the mutual respect from this person. I look up to like that. So there's a big, like a big connection that I don't think can be broken no matter what happens otherwise politically or anything or record sales or anything that he and I have because of the time we spent together when no one else was around. Okay. For me, it's still that. So I saw him transform from the thing that you talked about to the next thing, to the next thing, the next thing to see to what he is now. I was never in a band with any of those guys, but especially James when he wasn't pretty much plowed, you know? And so I don't know him as a sober person. It is wild, too, to think that whenever it comes to Jason and Metallica, it's always talked about mostly just the hazing and the insanity. But really, there's just years of of deep love in there, or else you wouldn't even have lasted two or three years. You know, people... None of us would have. Right, (laughs) right. They really ignore it. And it's funny just to hear you say right there, James and I shared the dressing room. And and in most people's minds, uh, they'd be like, oh, how the fuck did that go down? You know, but I think that I think deep inside he he I wonder at night if he goes like and especially when I was at the 30 year anniversary and you walked on stage and played again. There's got to be something in his mind of like, fuck, this has got some because we're talking about one of the greatest bass players of all time. Cliff Burton. Okay. And then for you to step in, if you, you know, look at those era, there is goddamn chemistry there and let it be the anger or whatever it is, there's chemistry. And I know that he looks at that probably and goes, fuck that shit is, it shit is fire. The background vocals, the playing, the style, the look, the, uh, the energy, and the, the lead singing, everything. So I know there's no way he doesn't go like, man, I was fucking brutal, you know? And I, and I get it. I, I always say he's on, on like Mach 3 of his demons right now, you know? Wow. Wow. Okay. And I was just going to use the same terminology. So Mach 1, uh, what I call with Cliff, right? That was its own chemistry that can never be topped. Everybody knows that. Nobody's ever argued that. Not me, for sure. <laughs> And then our chemistry that we had as Mach 2, it was its own thing with its own flavor. When it came to the live show, man, that was me, man. Okay, here I am. And follow that, motherfucker. You know, like that's right the whole time, every time. And we know that we had that too. And now the 20 years they've had with Robert, now this is this chemistry. And it's fucking firing too. So the, the key elements are still there, right? And you bring in people that have that much more talent. 
it's just amazing. Each one, I don't think anyone is really like better than the other. If you compare all the check, all the boxes and stuff, here's the pioneers. They set the standard. Here's the other thing. We kept up with it and took it to the people like never before. I mean, it would take a lot of years for them to play in order for Robert Nevis when he shows his side to have with them. He's been in 20 years. I've been in 15, but I still got twice on the show. We just, we went, we played a lot. Yeah, you did. You know, okay. So that there's just, there's something to that too. Actually, that might be the bottom line. I mean, nothing can replace the hours that you put together to create the chemistry you're speaking of, to mix that shit up, keep mix it up and make it stronger and stronger. You know, it wasn't like we hit some kind of weak spot and it's going fucking, and, and, and I, you know, it was always like, it was always standard, standard, standard that whole time. There was never a weak spot when I was there as far as I'm concerned. No, never, never, never. I did see recently that, uh, I think it was Kurt or maybe Lars was talking about when they play the justice stuff now, they've kind of straightened it out and dumped some stuff so they don't have to be so heady in it. It can be more of just rocking it. When uh, you guys were doing the Justice album, of course, one of the greatest tours of all time for Metallica, I, I saw it you know, five times, one being the Shoreline, Concord, and uh, then the Cow Palace, you know, just all of the great ones, indoors, outdoors, everything. But it was interesting when you first went out and you were playing the whole record, and, and I was fucking so into that. But what was that like to just remember all the changes and everything you're you're hitting some serious stuff here this is um you know a while ago you were talking about the hazing and all this thing right so there's exclusive clubs in the world and we know some of them in america and maybe a couple that we've traveled to in, in other countries and stuff but certain ones and elite athletes and these doctors and all you can do this brain surgery there's different elite clubs of things okay in the metal world this is the most elite club Right. So in order to be in that club, you have to have these prerequisites and all that odd logical shit. Yeah. And then you have to see if you can stay in the club. Right. It's one thing to get in. Can you stay in? Yeah. So in order to know the other guys who are already in the club and make up the club and decided the rules of the club, they have to know they can count on you as one of the club. All right. So if you were in that position, what would you do? You grill the fuck out of them because they got it. I have to speak for them when they are not there. I have to represent that whole fucking entity when I'm standing on my own. Now you just going to let any fucker come in and do that. Really? Really? Come on. I for, compared to what I really got, how awesome the ride was. Oh. That is like mud. It's mud on my shoe, dude. I don't if there's, it was actually, I wouldn't have the world citizen, whatever you call that thing, if they, if they didn't say, okay, dude, we're going to give you this. And if you could take it, you're with us. I did. Here we are. You know, it's like, fuck, I wouldn't have changed any of it for anything ever. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -mm. Now look at them now. Dean, if the things didn't happen the way they happened, can we guarantee that they would be there? If Jane, James hadn't went to rehab, if I wouldn't have went, Rah! and he wouldn't have went, and it wouldn't all have changed. He got himself together to be stronger than ever in his vocal and his health. If I wouldn't have done that, would that have happened? Would he have drank himself? Would he have drank himself to another thing, a thing, a thing? What would have happened? What would he kept running away from? You know, how do we know? We don't fucking know. What we know now is they're dominating again. The record was number one in 25 countries for two weeks ago. The fuck? 42 years later. There is an interesting thing that I always say about Metallica, and it's one of the most insane things I think I've ever seen with fans, quote unquote, I would say fans, is no matter what they seem to do, these shitty people come out and complain. It does not matter what the fuck they do. Cliff's gone. Metallica's done. Uh you know, they do the uh, nothing else matters. Metallica's done. They cut their hair on the load, reload records. Metallica's done. You know, it's just unbelievable. The snare tone, the sane anger record, the some kind of monster movie. All of it is the most insane thing I've ever seen in a band ever. And yet they're bigger than ever right now. It's awesome. <laughs> I got two things to say. 
about that. Okay, so first one is next time you make your album, okay? People that are saying this shit, next time you make your album, make sure to send me a copy. I'll let you know what I think, okay? <laughs> and I wish I could. And I, and I, wanted to re- oh, I wanted to remember what the other thing was, but I got so excited about that, I forgot. That's awesome. I got a, I, uh, so some of my key, uh, memories of Jason era Metallica, I have so many great fucking memories, uh, with you and the band. It's, it's mind boggling how much I love this era. Next one for me would be, and I interviewed Tom Gaffey and I'm a huge Phoenix theater guy. The warm up shows for the black tour. I was there both nights. I have the t-shirt upstairs. I was going to wear it during the interview, but I was like, ah, fuck it. But you wore it at the Russia concert, which is amazing to see. Uh, warm uh, Rehearsals at the Phoenix Theater. Let's talk about why that happened. And and let's talk about those two nights, if you remember. Because I remember both. I was front row balcony. And I Tom Gaffey runs and owns the place. And the Phoenix Theater is one of the most epic uh, venues in all of America because of what they do, letting kids' bands play there, skateboarding in there, all the punk early shit, Devo, Primus shooting, uh, My Name is Mud there. It has a history that is unbelievable. So run me through that. Do you remember those nights? I do. So it's August. I thought it was three nights. I thought it was August 1st, 2nd, 3rd. Maybe it was just two, a couple of those. But. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and and oh, quick question: Do you remember why you did it? Because Tom had said you guys were getting ready to go, and you just didn't feel like you had this black album shit together yet. Uh, it's a fairly common thing for bands at that level to go and play to the converted uh, for a couple uh, to make sure that everything's square. So you know, you make your mistakes in front of the people that don't mind seeing that kind of thing. There were different time, times through my career with them anyway that we would, uh, I think it was McNichol Arena in Denver or something, you know, rent out for the week to get everything together and then go to a club and play a little bit to get our things, get all our yayas out in front of people, okay, get all the nerves and all that stuff in front of people that are already excited about being there. I think that happens every single tour. So we would do something like that, a couple of clubs or something like yeah. Uh, to get to get the rust busted off, and there's a gazillion people that can sit on their couch and go, right? You put them in front, put them up in front of people. Don't that fucking don't. You know, it's it's just nah. So you have to. It's not for everyone. That many people spend blood and there's things spit naked and whatever. Like, well, I got this. You know, that's it's there's something to it. Well, I will tell you this, man. Those shows, and whenever I see Metallica in a small venue. It has got to be some of the most intense shit you've ever seen. Uh, you know, over the years, I've seen a ton of the the secret shows, you know, including yes, the yes. some kind of monster when they took a break and Bob Rock played, you know, down there on Polk Street. Crazy. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. man. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. That's enough for me. Sorry. It, it's so fucking crazy to to see the band in a in a club type of thing, you know. Um, so after those two shows, there you are off and running for the black album. And of course your entire life is going to change and you're not going to be home for a long time. Now I just did a two month tour and we played every night for 32 of the 33 dates. And I was laughing in the tour bus going, this is just the first two months of the black album tour. Now you have three more years, motherfucker. So tell me about when you hit the wall on that tour of like, holy shit, are we ever going home? Uh, we saw it just grow and grow and grow. We saw the crew grow. We saw the checks grow. We saw the crowd grow. We saw the sales grow. All that. The demand. And within it, we were treated better and better the whole time. There was more people there to make sure you had everything you needed because it's four people that are the face and the power and the music that are bringing in all these millions of dollars. And there's hundreds of people working on the crew and all that thing that need to get a check. So they got to make sure that all four of us are firing. So they're there to have Kirk's got his uh, nutrition thing wired. I got mine my way. Lars says, it's this way, whatever, like, you know what I mean? Everybody's got their own workout. Lars is running. Kirk is doing his yoga. I'm riding my bike. You know, I took my bike on tour a bunch of times. You know, just, that's, that's what I did. 
So we all did our own thing to be what the force needed to be on the on one time came each night. That in itself, that attitude individually and collectively, knowing that we're not going to ever let each other down. Kind of talking about a little bit before. No people you can count on. Okay, does this guy made of the M-E-T-T-L-E metal? Is he made of it? And or does he have the right kind in order to do all this day after day, night after night, year after year with us? Right? The crew is the key. Okay? As long as you got people that fucking get it, they understand and they truly care. All right. I don't know how it is now in that organization on the road or otherwise. No, I've kept the distance on purpose. Okay. But in that time, we're going through eras now, you and I. Yeah. And in that era, the family, the family cannot kill the family. The family that was around on that, that black elm tour at one, 105 crew guys at that time, 11 buses, 13 trucks. I mean, you know, the real deal, man. No, there wasn't a weak link. As soon as a weak link showed up, boom, gone, man, gone, fucking sorted out immediately, sussed immediately. You know, the, the carpenters wouldn't allow somebody that could speak for them that wasn't saying the right shit and all the way right down the line. Everybody took that pride. Everybody carried that pride. You know, so when you have that as the like logistically, the way that they were able to arrange everything for us to be fucking on point the whole time, that's why they knew how to do that and make us as strong as possible. That's it. That's why you could do how many ever I could have going and going. By the time we got to that last one, you know, uh, Vector Belgium, uh, July 3rd, 93, something or other. Um, you know, I could have kept going, bro. I mean, I was I was glad that we were going home for a second. I really did. I, I really wanted to go count some money, man. Okay, fucking A. I did, okay? I think we all did. No, the, who wouldn't? God damn it. You know, they've been saying, hey, you, you, you're, number, you're number one in 30 cut. You got this and the radio's that. Nothing else matters. Is blue, you know, all this shit. Okay, great. That sounds great. Where's the fucking dough, man? Right? Get home and go, okay. Okay. Right? All of that sweating and the, the sacrifice. The sacrifice that is required for that to happen. Girlfriend, wife comes second. Mom, grandma, dog. Everything of a normal life, domestication, whatever. Second, third, second, but that all the way down the line. Nothing comes before it. So you just 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 think about that for a second. You don't get to go to your nieces thing or the brother's thing or grandma's thing or the, whether it's good, bad or otherwise you don't get to go you know, that's 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 some shit, I'm not, I'm not complaining, I'm just saying that's facts. Yeah, well yeah and it's also what people don't understand is the heaviness of once you step off of that thing and everybody doing everything for you and there you are in Walnut Creek, California in your house and you're like the adrenaline is gone. Now you're fucked because you're sitting there going like, God damn, I'm home now for a couple of weeks. I'm bored. I need that fucking blast. That's a crazy thing that people don't understand that. So the uh, there's before there was PTSD actually or anything that we would have been aware of that or that term maybe existed. We call it PTD, post-tour depression. And so it's it's a real thing that's existed as long as there's been this. The way that they pushed Elvis, the way they pushed Jerry Lee or whatever, it's just the same. And also within, uh, I've talked about this before too, but not with you, um, extreme sports and these type of things, uh, 20 or maybe 25 years worth of, uh, you know, we used to do a 360 on our skate and thought we were badass. And now they do a 3600 or whatever the fuck, you know, it's like, this is what is now. Okay. The guy's jumping off the motorcycle upside down, looking backwards, doing all this stuff. Okay, adrenaline junkie, adrenaline junkie. He's an adrenaline junkie. He jumps from the plane and that shit, right? This is real. This is not just a loosely uh, used term that became comfortable in our culture or whatever. This is a real fucking thing, right? So when you do get that dose, it's not just about, I mean, the reason we're doing this, the reason you do comedy, the reason you do what you do and the thanks and music for any of us do or Bill or anybody, is that, you know, we want to show off. We spent a bunch of fucking time learning this craft, and now we're going to go show off, and we want some recognition for it. You know? That that gets to really start taking you off. That's the beginning of the juice. 
That's the beginning of the juice. You worked up that hard to get show somebody, and then there's people there, so it kicks it up to about there, right? You're going to show up, oh, oh my God, I'm going to sweat and holy fuck, right? Trying to get to that place because you want to show that you are that good. You wanted to clap afterwards. Fuck, that was worth it, you know? But then when there's 10, 30, 40, 70, 50, how many people in Russia, and they are all pushing their juice, the same energy, same voice, the star, the same frequencies, which is the most important thing, the same frequencies at four people. Flesh. <laughs> and you still, right? It's, it's, like, the, it's like giant fucking, um, uh, what do you call it on the, on the roof there? The solar panels. Okay, you're, so, <laughs> you're soaking all that, <laughs> soaking all that shit in, but then the solar panels process it and give you this, right? So you have to process it and go, like that even more so. But during that process, your adrenal, pituitary, every other goddamn thing is going, fuck, right? And it gets used to it. it that's, what you're, that's what you're talking about, okay? Your body will do anything you ask it to. You want to be a junkie? It'll do that. You want to be a marathon runner? It'll do that. You want to be on your bike? You want to do this? A good swimmer? It'll do that eventually if you do it, if you if you program it to do that. So if you program it to get that fucking dose five times a week for 26 months in a row, <laughs> come down from that, bro. It took me 15 years to come down from 15 years, okay? You know, like you stop smoking 15 years, you do the same deal, man, same fucking thing. Run me through that Russia concert because I still think that it's one of the greatest and I and I would say very underrated of of the magnitude of this to see first of all where you're playing in Russia to see the amount of people to see the soldiers and then to see those helicopters it looks like a scene from Apocalypse Now run me through that man how you get to Russia you you you're ready to do the show and you see the magnitude of the audience and everything what was that like it started brewing i'll go right from the top it started brewing when we were opening for angus uh acdc in uh eastern Bloc. okay there was still communist countries romania still communist you know there's still and um there was rumblings about the this coup that was happening and because we always had to be careful there's a lot of times when they would bring the schedule to you and you see all the Johannesburg, you don't know, see all this different stuff. Oh, we're going to play there. No, you don't get to because the president got assassinated or, assassinated or the political thing. Or you can't do that because you're not safe. They don't have the right power. You know, there's all that shit happened a lot of times. So they start talking about it. We already got our shows at ACDC. We don't cancel shows unless God says so. Two times since I was in band. And, you know, whatever winter or storm or anything that comes at us, ACDC, we're going to do the show. No matter where we are. And of course, those people are very receptive. It's not very, very many people have the power, logistics, crew to be able to go to a place like that. You can go to Topeka and ship it, go into those places. That's something, you know. So we had our crews and our stuff together and our gear and our trucks and everything already not too far from where they were, you know, really as the crow flies, I guess you can say or something. Uh, and it came down that um, they asked the kids uh, that stand, stood up to the tanks and stuff, uh, what do you want in reward for this bravery? And I said, we want American rock and roll. He said, Guns N' Roses, Metallica, and ACDC. Those are the first names that they mentioned. And so Time, Wa Time Warner got involved. And they said, okay, well, we have Metallica and ACDC right over the border over here. And we could get them, you know, the crew and the thing, and then bring their amps and whatever their, you know, Angus's have a trail and shit. We'll bring your, your thing over there. It all comes down. Time Warner sends a plane for us, right? And up until that point, we'd had nice craft and everything, safe, nice craft. Um, it took a while to the ones so you could actually stand up and stuff. But um, and we start, started to get to the time where it was a little bit nicer. But they sent this thing that was just, that room you got fake behind you, that would have fit in one of the parts of the plane. Oh. You know, it was like this 777 or some big thing with couches and all the, you know, like really dialed out. Like in the movies, like a bar and, you know, the thing. Um, and it was... Uh, it was ACDC and Black Bros and Metallica on the same plane and a few other people uh, to get over there. And we got to customs and we got, landed in, um, in Moscow. And it wasn't that really, as I remember, the airport we particularly landed in, it wasn't that grand of a thing. It seemed you know, kind of locked in time almost, really. 
couple decades behind. And they held us there. And there was like, there's, I don't know how the miscommunication that they didn't realize that the fucking prime minister invited us to come and play, you know, like you didn't get that memo. So they held us for a second, but we come to find out, um, uh, Chris Robinson was with us, right? And he had the, uh, the tan, like, um, what do you call that? Split leather pants. And then, uh, with, uh, with, uh, pot leaves sewn down the side. That's right. And so, th- so they get hella suspicious. Yeah. And so they, they hold all of us and they take him off to the side with the dogs and all the thing, but none of us were dumb enough to bring anything to fucking Russia. Anyway. Yeah. Right. And not, not even him, you know, not even those guys. So we finally got going, um, get to the hotel. And there, once again, we could have been in Albuquerque. There was kids lined up. They had their Metallica shirts and the album, their, their poster, uh, all the things like you would expect. It was like any other place we landed, except that, um, you know, that shirt could be four or six weeks wages for an ACDC t-shirt. It could be for the album, the, the Metallica album, that's probably two months wages. Uh, for the copy of the copy of the cassette with the fake cover on it, of that, that was probably two weeks, you know, but they, but they still had it there for us to sign, you know, but I didn't know the thing about that until after we got in to the place that that's how it was for them. It just looked normal to me. Like we landed in any other place. So we get into the hotel and it was about, uh, I mean, I probably 3000 rooms in this hotel. It looked like a giant kind of penitentiary gray, I go, it's gray sky, gray building, gray food. Um, we go into the place. And it was uh, $4 for a room, like a, a junior suite. And it was $8 for a bottle of Heineken. Wow. <laughs> so metaphorically, you know, like, and so we started figuring out that that's how it was. There's not a whole lot of middle class. There's this or this, you know, we've seen that in a lot of other places before too, but this was something different. And it raised up in the Midwest, you know, the time that I did, um, we st- Still did duck and cover when I was a kid and all that. So going to Russia and this type of thing, it was so not that. <laughs> Everybody could, they couldn't have been nicer. They couldn't have been more respectful. They couldn't have been more embracing to us. You know, it's fucking amazing. And then as we drove and did photographs and looked around the town for the, you know, 12 or 16 hours leading up to going to the show, we noticed a lot of poverty and stuff, man. And it just was really kind of, uh, I always, I always see this being grateful for everything that we have, you know, grateful for clean water. It really makes you think of some things you learn when you're out there, no matter how grand the trappings are, that you're able to see through that and see that not everybody had is, has it like you and me, you know? And so that I really learned a lot from that trip on that particular part. So we got through all of that, and then we went to the gig like any other time. Okay, you, your sound check is here, and Black Crow's sound check is here, and Pantera, and then ACDC, and so on forth, like any other fucking day. Okay, so we get there to the grounds and the dressing rooms are army tents, you know, and that's not the worst that's ever happened either. But it was just kind of weird considering the ball of it all. And there's a bunch of people kind of running around knocking into each other. And there's soldiers everywhere. What ended up being like 11,000 troops. Right. So we go, well, what is the, you know, we used to seeing the guys with the yellow security, the football players from the college or the guys, you know, between the barrier barricade. No, nah, these guys, full red army with the fuzzy shit and automatic weapons and shit, very different. Um, so we go, that's an awful lot of guys with guns, don't you think, for this thing? I mean, you really, well, what it is, is uh, you guys, I'm not sure if you know, it's a free concert. And they went on the national radio at every, every whatever they call it, province of every country within Russia, whatever they call that. Um, to say it's free and you can come, get on a plane and come, or get on a train or whatever, make your way down here. So people made their way by foot, by bike, by train, by boat, but whatever the hell they did. They came all from all countries. And that's one of the things you use when you watch the video, you see all the flags from the different countries flying over and or the different provinces or whatever you call that. Um, so that in itself, like we'd seen some cool shit. We played Donington a few times, some other really big things, but nothing quite like this because of the setting, because of the scenario, you know? So already that was you're on point a little more. Your head's on a swivel a little bit more. It always has to be, but really more there. And I could talk about the show, but you must, you please get in something. Well, the footage is just fucking unreal, man. I mean, you'd never see anything like that. You look at it and you just go like, wow. It, it is interesting, too, because 
me growing up in the Bay Area, uh, I always say the turning point for Metallica, the changing of the guard was the day on the green uh, with the Scorpions. Okay. That is the day that everyone in the Bay Area and the business, the music business, and even Bill Graham was like, wow, what the fuck is this, man? And That's correct. when you think about key Metallica gigs, a lot of them were giant uh, game changers outdoors, which is interesting. You know, the Day in the Green with Cliff and then uh, the Russia concert, the, the Day in the Green when you finally come back and they come back as headliners. Now, that is a fucking game changer. Here they are opening and a few years later, they're back headlining in their own backyard. Yeah. Um, the October 12th, 91, I think that's what you were speaking of, or the last concert that Bill Graham put on, actually. Absolutely. Um, and to me, growing up around the, the day on the greens, you know, I mean, you know, Zeppelin, everything, you know. Right. And a lot of people that you, you know, that are in our circles, that cross each other's circles from those places, we all have, or they all, I don't, but they all have those stories. You have those stories of seeing those days on the days on the green. I remember Kirk's stories about them when he was young. You know, big, big deal. The same as me seeing Nugent on the Michigan Jam or whatever. It's the same thing for us, you know. So um, I remember specifically that show. We we had been, okay, so from the Phoenix Theater from August 1st uh, up to that point with a couple of months to go out around how many countries did for that time, that chunk of lot, though, in that amount of time. And we were just in stride, just fuck, whoa, all cylinders, man, just in stride. And I remember... Uh, I had all finally had my complete arsenal of alembic bases made in Santa Rosa, right? Right, NorCal, right? Okay, so they were they were so stoked, and that, that six string bass, I remember the neck about that fucking wide, you know, biggest string like that, you know, and and just in Sabbath True tuned down, foo, oh, oh, and the whole outdoors, the whole band goes, ooh, ooh. you could just feel the whole. <laughs> I was like, I was shaking. I was shaking every single person's innards, man. I remember the meat of it. And then a couple cats that were bass players, also friends up there, came and said afterwards, dude, the bass sound was the sickest thing that I've heard. And I just remember feeling it from the stage sound that good. And then for them to say it out there, that was really a special time. So game changers as a collective, game changers as individuals, because coming back to prove myself to those folks, to you, and to your, you know, the circles that you run in, that was a big deal for me. It was very important to me. At that time, you start playing the Olympic bases. And it is interesting to think about because uh, there, there's the era, of course, Petaluma, Mesa Boogie, big, big thing with Metallica's Crunch, Captain Crunch, the cool shirts, everything. Boogie was the thing. That's a, a uh, Petaluma, California Randall Smith, who is the owner and kind of the uh, first boutique amp builder. And then here you are with Olympic. So not only are they a Bay Area band, uh, you know, people are they from L.A.? Fuck you. They're from the Bay Area. You know, <laughs> that's in my eyes. But they supported all of these Bay Area uh, companies and, and people, BAM Magazine, The Stone, Mesa Boogie, you go on and on and on. Let me talk to you about the Olympic bases because at the time, it was more of a hippie type of thing of Phil Lesh, Santana guys, everybody. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, Jerry Garcia played Olympic and and, yeah. Irwin and all that stuff. What made you go for that uh, Olympic? Was it to get a custom five or six string bass? Uh, in the beginning, I think it kind of started out like you're talking about NorCal Pride. Kind of, it really took everybody over there. There's something there in Metallica and the Bay Area and the support that was shown and just the actual that we know that's the that's the cream of the crop shit right there. You know, we know that. The world knows that. Um, so that's the beginning of it, the Mesa Boogie especially. Um, when I recorded the Flotsam album, the uh, Doomsday for the Deceiver, I borrowed an Olympic bass from a guy. It was the El Explorer style. I think it's called the Stiller or something like that. Oh, like uh, from the Who uh, and Twistle? Yes, yes. Kind of that type of trip. Yep. Right. And it just, it was just evil. And then you, how it blends on that record, it just, you know, you can hear it. And it's just, it's very special. So it was also out of reach, considerably out of reach, right? 
So, so it, yeah, it's like a coveted thing, you know. And so by the time that I could afford them, then I'm going to have them, right? And that, that they were there and they were local. So I went up to visit them and they were very nice to me. So the Wickersham family who ran that, you know, back then, um, Ron Wickersham was in with the Grateful Dead guys and helped design their, their PAs and the thing and the guitars and all that, and, you know, fancy motherboard inside the bass and holy crap. And then also Stanley Clark, um, the two of the, I guess, two of the real albums I had when I owned four albums when I was nine or 10 years old. Uh, with Jeff Beck with Stan the Clark on the bass, and he played uh, Lembic basses. So there's all this kind of roots from a, you know deep down. Then when they finally showed up, and then also when I got to go test them, you know I got my pick going and everything. And it goes fucking gang, fucking gang. You know can really make it growl and teeth are sharp. I'm like I want that. And so they said okay, make these uh, picked out all the wood and the thing. You know design them and everything. Solid maple basses. Okay, so that's why they ping like that super hard wood super bright uh and heavy as fuck so that six string bass i'm not sure at least two less paul's weight you know really serious and that's and that's why the neck that's why <laughs> one of the reasons for yeah for the neck and that but the alembic thing because once they they were so supportive and then i said build me all these bases and they were psyched because of you know metallica being so giant I was building all black bases to go along with the black album that we were going to tour with. And they were, that was probably the biggest exposure they'd had in any kind of, what do you call, not quite mainstream yet, but for them, mainstream. You never went with Boogie Head. You used Boogie Cabs, but you didn't like the Boogie Head. You were SVT all the time and still to now, or what's going on with that? So when I went to audition, um, I used Cliff's Mesa Boogie gear. And, uh, you know, with maybe, maybe two speakers working out of six, you know, so. <laughs> but, uh, I, I liked it from then. I played bass at boogie early on and I still have, um, Cliff, Cliff's main head and stuff like that in my archive thing with, you know, behind the glass and all that shit. Um, you have that? So that was, that, yeah. So that was a thing that I used way back then. And the guys, you know, graced me with that. So, uh, SVT was always the thing that really was the thing with the Alembic and the SVT that made that crazy ass growl. So I just, I continued with that. And they were very supportive back in the day too. They really were. So many things have changed, bro, in that much time. Back then there was proper folks that would come out and they'd hook you up and let you test some stuff and send it to Zach and we'd blow it up and send it back. And, you know, pretty much fun. Yeah, but Ampeg's always been there like that. What do you have for um, vintage bases? Like, I think you had like a, what, like a Lake Placid Blue or something, jazz, or what do you have? Vintage. Um, the collection is quite extensive now, Dean, you know. Um, so since 80, probably end of 86 or early 87 was the first time that I went shopping with Kirk in some Chicago guitar store and got bits since then. So that many years I've been collecting, trading, and so forth. So there's a great deal of vintage instruments. There's a, a freaking arsenal of 57, 58, 59P bases and you know all those kind of things. Um, all the cool stuff like that that I was very lucky to get very early on. I had done most of my purchasing of vintage stuff before 2000. Now I just trade. Yeah, yeah, I get it, yeah. But what, what are your thoughts looking back now on the load and reload era? Um, I've been a, a, a lot of people know I'm not a big fan of that era. Um, what are your thoughts on that era? Do you, uh, do you dig the, the tunes in the era or do you feel that it was necessary to change into a uh, more rock and roll, uh, you know, being into thin Lizzy and, and UFO and ACDC and stuff, take it, take a different direction. You know, by the time that came around and everybody had gone to count their money and or get married and or, you know, the, the gang mentality kind of dissipated, of course. And we found our own corners to go to because we spent so much time doing that. So we would all retreat to our corners. At that time, I just done my own POV, um, detached. Um, to answer the question in general, as far as the groove and the vibe and the weight of the bass and that, you know, always digging that kind of thing anyway i was fine with any you know the tempos and stuff and the musicality of it i liked for the most part i always liked the high energy stuff better i always felt i performed the faster things better and the things you could really sink your teeth into was of course as a fan of 
that kind of music and Sepultura and all the stuff, I, I would always lean that way. But I did, I liked the groove and I liked how Bob helped me get certain weight with the basses and, and, and teach me to, you know, chill the fuck out with the notes, man. And just, you know, lay that concrete down and let, if the more concrete you lay down, the further the guitars get pushed up front and the more chance you've got to be in loud as fuck. So it's just like, just lay that concrete down, kind of doing that more groovy things. You know, the bands you mentioned, those kind of rock bands that always had that little bit of groove to them. See, there's, I'll say one thing first, uh, the, my brothers, I have eight year old and five year older brothers, right? So I heard Hendrix really early and that kind of cool shit, early seventies music drilled into me when I was a little kid. So that I didn't know it, but the reason I was drawn to the bass dominant funk music or putting fire Ohio players and all these different things, I didn't realize it when, but then why I ended up being a bass player and I didn't know why. There's certain things that were ingrained in me that I want to go with that groove, you know, but those guys brought all those songs and I tried to adapt to them the best I could. Um, I think they're still solid records, but I wouldn't probably call them my favorites. It, it's funny. Uh, I recently opened up for Metallica. Uh, now it's been, I guess, two years now. It's the, It was the 40, 40 year anniversary. I did stand up comedy in San Francisco at the Chase Center two nights. And it was the the scariest thing I've ever done, the hardest thing I've ever done, and the greatest thing I've ever done. And I've done a lot of great shit in my life, not like sitting there bragging, but I've had some high watermarks in my life, like opening for Burr at Red Rocks or the mm. LA Forum or doing the mm. Oakland Coliseum, that kind of shit. But to stand on stage with them and be asked to do it and the, the amount of... Uh, I would say nervousness I had because I didn't want to fuck it up. And, you know, it's comedy. It's almost set up to fail uh, opening for Metallica doing comedy. But the reason it had so much weight with me was I thought the greatest nights of my life were seeing them on the 30th anniversary at the Fillmore. And that was the night that I sat in the corner and realized you know what? I love ACDC. I love Prince. I love Zeppelin. I love the dead. I love all kinds of music. But at that moment in that corner of that room, the first night, I realized this is our band and this is the greatest band to me of all time. Uh, for me, as far as not, you know, I didn't see Zeppelin, but I love fucking Zeppelin. I love the mystique of it. And, you know, to see these guys that were not good looking, did not have radio songs to, you know, the grassroots bringing of, of, of you know, of, of rising up to see that. I realized that moment in that room, this was the greatest band. So what I'm trying to say in a long fucking uh, question is, what was that like for you to come back for the 30th? not playing for a long time and uh and what was the vibe like truly it felt like two weeks had went by and uh my girl and i drove over the bridge and with my buddy and we parked the car at the Fillmore, and we walked up the back stairs just like any other fucking time and you know the only difference was everybody screaming at me and I didn't know what to expect. I was very excited about it, but I was also really trying to keep it low, man. I wasn't going in any kind of, you know, this at all. I didn't know what to expect. Really. I was just really excited about being a part of it. And I had my chops up, dude. I never let them go down, you know, and uh, walk in with my buddy and my wife there and everybody's just reacting. And I saw, you know, Cliff, uh, uh, Cliff's dad, Ray was there and Torben, they're sitting there. And a lot of people just from the past and such a warm thing right away. And people saw me from the floor and started, you know, giving me the sign and screaming out my name and stuff. And it was such an incredible thing came over me. Once again, the adrenaline starts to flow. And uh, by the time I got up there, you know, I still had the same attitude. I, I still did the same thing. The reason I say it felt like two weeks, because all the same people are around, the same wardrobe girls, the same core crew. And that thing. So I walk into one of the rooms. I make a space for myself. I put out my thing. I do my stretches. I put on my vocal warm up. I all just like fucking two weeks ago, man. Get back going. And the attitude that always is, and no matter arrogance or I don't give a fuck. But you know, if I'm playing, I don't give a fuck who else is playing. You know, 
Like I, I, I respect Rob Halford and I love King Diamond and all them cats and all that. But if I'm getting ready for my show and I'm going on that stage, no matter who was there before or after, it doesn't matter. But especially when I'm playing with those guys. It's the way it goes, man. And that's how I felt. I felt all that power come back over me. It was, it was unreal. I, st- I stood in the corner and I got to tell you, before I interviewed you today, I rewatched the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and I got choked up. And that second when you walked on stage and just now, right now, it hit me some goosebumps. I get choked up because I'm like, there it is, man. That's yep, it. it That's it the thing right it there. Is. It is. And the audience immediately goes crazy. And it's it's it, you cannot fucking deny what you're seeing and hearing and feeling right there. Right. So all of us, no matter what it is we do, we want to think or feel or be assured even perhaps reassured maybe that we did something right. That we did maybe even more importantly, the thing that we put all the sacrifice and all the commitment to, that we did it right. We conducted ourselves correctly. We did it right. That answer came, whoa, there we go. That answer came to me the first four seconds that I came onto the stage that night. It's been a long time. I've been away for, what, 10 years or whatever. And uh, people screamed me back. And it just happened to be that, you know, I was already entertaining, getting Flotsam back together original band i was auditioning people to maybe play a metal band again and kind of on the cusp am i gonna do this i don't fucking know and i go back and they're screaming back into it and that uh see so six weeks later or so seven um got together with a flotsam original band the doomsday band and i went to phoenix and we played two different weekends in phoenix um the uh, doomsday album in its entirety and that to talk about busting through to remember shit. You were talking about justice. Talk busting through to remember that whole album, dude. Some gray matter there. That's serious. So we did it. Felt good, sounded good, and everything. But just the dynamics and things, and what had transpired for people, and transpired for me at a different pace, and whatever you know, it just wasn't going to work. Uh, so then that led me to April that year, getting together with Jesus Mendez Jr. and Jesse Farnsworth, who became. The trio, the Newstead Heavy Metal Music Trio, and then we added Mike Newshock later and made the, the uh, EP and the LP and did a tour and all that kind of thing. So my answer to your question is that the 30th anniversary with Metallica, those four nights or whatever with you in the corner, convinced me to come back to metal. They convinced me to get a band back. They convinced me to form Newstead. They convinced me to write the songs, front the band, go out and sing and tour 24 countries again. You know, that's what happened at the 30th anniversary. That's what happened that night. So what you felt in the corner, I felt from that stage a million fold. Yeah. I mean, when you released the Newstead EP, it was fucking incredible. Like, wow, this is great songwriting, great singing, metal. And it's just a, a, a just a smoker of a, a an EP. And, you know, you look back at Soldier Head, God Snake, King of the Underdogs, King of the Underdogs kind of had a vibe of like helmet to me a little bit. Nice. You know, nice. Kind of you know, that tight yeah, yeah, yeah. age had. But that was interesting also time because there was these questions I had about you. Because when you left Metallica, there was all different uh press, of course. You had the Echo Brain, you had the some kind of monster footage, you had that. And I know how documentaries are edited. We could turn this documentary this way for or sure. Turn it that way in the edit. A million Any ways. Way million edited, ways. It's going to fucking change the story by an edit. But my point was at the time you left Metallica, there was a the thought of your neck vertebrae were really fucked. You felt like you couldn't play Metallica at the level you wanted to do it. Was that true? Or were you just saying that because you were a little bit like tired of people going why would you do echo brain over metallica are you fucking crazy what was the truth on that because you come back and you do newstead and it's metal and you are rocking it you know right uh the bones and the cartilage are what they are so it might be the theme of our talk here (laughs) the flesh and the bone um you know that, that damage is there you don't have to watch too many videos to know it's a very easy equation okay yeah so that that damage is done and what i had said 
exactly back in the day was that um, to go the way that I went with Metallica when we were that family in Mach 2, um, that was two hours and 20 for a show, right? And that's that many songs. And I was as strong on battery at the very end as I was at the top over here, right? So that that's what I was used to. So doing that two hours and 20, the monster that I would insist on being for myself and for the people, that no longer exists. I can't do it that way with all that shit, right? But for the Newstead band, like we're doing right now, you know, we're getting ready to play a show in a couple of weeks here for the first time in 10 years. Very exciting. Just got done with my boys, as I told you, a couple hours ago. We spent the whole weekend rehearsing about 15 hours in, 16 maybe. And uh, it's a different kind of physicality. And I still get it in because I can't stop it. It is kind of innate and whatever and involuntary. But uh, it's not the same demand. It's not the same demand. And I'm singing every song. And I have to pay attention a lot to singing. So I don't just have the thing over there and play the bass and go, well, die, you know, and stuff and come back. It's, I, I, I have to be conducting the whole band, playing the bass while singing, which is, you know, a lot harder than just playing guitar chords and singing. <laughs> keeping the groove going and singing as a motherfucker. So it took a little while to get that going, but it changes my demand on the stage. It's not the same head bang thing as it is the leader of the band being up there and looking in everybody's eyes and conducting with the vocal and talking in between and, you know, like the, the performance, the entertainment part of it. So it's just a different way. So I could do a couple hours with the Newstead band um, and I pace it very differently. There you go. And Newstead band now, the newer stuff is quite punk. Um, I had put together this uh, kind of motorhead flavor thing about a year and a half ago and wrote these fun, uh, like motorhead flavored songs. So the bass has the first instrument. And I took the main three filthy animal drum beats and you just pick that one and make a song to pick that one, make a song make, and go around a couple of times and then write that many songs right? and do that thing. So I wrote some fun songs and now we mix those in with the uh, soldier hat and heroic dose and the ones from the videos that people know. Um, but mostly playing new songs and they are way less complex, way less complex than Flotsam and Metallica or even the Newstead band or Echo Brain, certainly. Um, just real punk rock straight ahead, like Motorhead, grind, fucking uh, that kind of shit. And a lot of fast stuff, a lot of double bass. Um, still pretty quick. Most of it pretty quick, actually. Yeah. So mostly just fun, though. Fun as fuck. Is this going to be a one-off gig or are you going to tour? Because I know that one of the, the bummers of the Newstead uh, was you were just rifling out money because of, you know, you're playing clubs, you got the tour bus, you got, you're paying the band, you're paying the crew, you're paying hotels, you're paying for gas, you're paying for food, you're paying everything. So is this going to be a touring thing or what's going to happen? So just so we know about the Newstead thing, you know, all that was my choice, right? I take, I do voluntarily take on that, voluntarily set up the show, voluntarily know I'm going to be putting out the dough and all that thing. I took that on. That was my green light for my boys to be comfortable and have whatever they needed in the way that I knew it. Okay. So the way that I know it's pretty fucking grand. And so trying to keep those guys in that place. And I did, I made sure that they were taken care of in that way. We rehearsed hard. We presented well. We had some great, positions in some cool festivals we still went and played the same fields that i played with metallica all the years in the big goddamn shows they're just called different things now it used to be called donnington now it's called download and it's called hellfest and the same fields sixty thousand people open for maiden there and this thing we had some great gigs so within all of that yes uh it more than the money i think more than the money because i said i did i did already volunteer that i didn't realize it was going to be quite uh, so substantial but the main thing was trying to wear too many hats at once trying to think that i knew everything trying to have all of the answers for everybody that came at me and still have enough capacity to front the band and sing and write the songs and do all the interviews and be the spokesman and do all of that it's a lot i should know it's a lot it's a lot and i should have asked for more help but I was determined all through at least the first 20 years after I left the big band, I was not going to coattail by any of my own doing. I always very straight with anybody that's ever worked with me, any advertising, even for the flyers for this show right here. You can't write Metallica. You don't fucking write Metallica on anything ever. Okay. If 
the this guy that has the fanzine and this guy that has his show on the thing. Or what, they're going to say it. Okay, but our source material does not say it ever. I'm not doing it. Everybody already fucking knows. Okay, but I'm not doing it that way. I'm just not going to do it like that. Echo Brain I did on my own. It had nothing to do with any management. The Voivod thing, nothing to do with any of their management. New Stead Project, nothing to do with any Q Prime. Nothing. Okay, just my own. Now, the New Stead thing is coming back out, and I'm at the place where this is going to be the gauge. Is it possible for them to scream me back into it like they did at the Fillmore? This we will find out on May 20th in Fort Lauderdale, if they bring me back. Okay, if they bring me back, then they do. And if they don't, they don't. And here I am, and I'm still happy. It's going to be a crazy fucking show. We've been working hard on the songs, and I'm ready to give it. You know, it is actually only selfish, self-absorbed, self-centered, narcissistic, whatever this is right here. I have to prove to myself I can do it. Just about your question, two questions ago. I have to show myself that I can do that for these new songs that I have. I can take it to the people, still present that I want, and walk away like this to myself, actually. I need that. Okay, I need that. I played the Chop House band for the last 10 years, learned to play acoustic guitar, wrote awesome songs, had violins, female singers, and all this colorful, wonderful shit. Okay, it was actually 30 years in the making because Chop House original was 92. And we did our biggest performance to record an album last year with Chop House band. 30 years brewing while everything else still happened. Yeah, but it was always Johnny Cash, American, and all that. And that's still what it is. I stepped out of that in February this year. Step back into the metal to see if I could still throw this shit down. And that's what it comes down to first. So I'm able to feel good about it, get that response back that really this could be worth it again. Cool. If not, that's how we do a reissue of the heavy metal music. Maybe record another album. Just go in the studio. So people want to have it. Some videos or just the live stuff we've been recording and do some live releases. Who knows? But the people will decide for me. It's funny to talk about uh, Chop House because... I played rock and metal and then around, I would say 92 ish, 93, I start getting into heavy duty acoustic music all the way up into the two thousands uh, with the alt country of like Lucinda Williams, Wilco, Jayhawks and, and Sunvolt and all of that. Uncle Tupelo fell in love with that stuff and, and love it just as much as I do metal. And it is funny to think about when you go for a change, um, what that means to people. Because some people are just so want to box you into something. They're like, "Why? What is this?" And it took a long time for me to uh, to change people's minds. And now I'm doing comedy, which is weird. But you know, I wrote and I learned acoustic guitar. I wrote a record, recorded it at. at uh, at a studio in San Francisco, put it out, toured for years. And, and, and my love of that alt country type of music is massive, man. I mean, massive. Agreed. Um, it was always that also in our house and that kind of feel. And certainly the folk explosion and stuff, late sixties and all that. And my parents had the mouse and the papas and all those things. So that went pretty deep in, too. And I think that's where my love for it uh, stays, you know, ignited, but also rekindled by, um, you know, Jason Isbell and this kind of thing that I just see uh, great hope. I see hope. I feel the, the, the talent, the songwriting, the, the wordsmithing, just so fantastic. And, and, and it's, it's uh, enviable and at the same time, just um, so easy to appreciate. You know, you, you shouldn't have to ever try hard to like something, man. You either do or you don't, man. There's two kinds of music, good and not good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, Chris Stapleton is a game oh, changer, man. Oh, come on, man. Come I, I on mean, now. When you hear that, and, and Jamie yeah. Johnson, you get into yes. the outlaw yes. country, the wave, the you know, second generation of it. Those guys are neighbors and shit. Can you imagine their porch jams? I just can't even, it's just mind-blowing to me to think about what they do when they get together just hanging out man all those guys like on a few feet of each other incredible <laughs> but um you become friends with his bell and his guys 400 unit you know go to nicole and i go to you know, a lot of other shows there i'm more than just about anybody recently for sure i love that stuff but it 
His guitar player has one of my favorite records of the last couple of years, man. Sadler. Yeah. Yeah. Have you heard his record? I have not. Oh my God. If you like Tom Petty Wildflowers, this record is going to fucking knock you out, dude. Wow. It is a really good. killer record. This guy can write some songs. He can yeah. sing. And it was one of my favorite records of the last few years. He's really, uh, oh, oh, there is no weak link there either. Just fantastic ensemble. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 So that's just, it's so much fun to go to those places and then, you know, actually um, collecting songs, you know, realizing what that's all about. And I had two different song Bibles, as I call them. And so I, the, my, my uh, cover song Bible, Heroes, I call it, um, I always keep 100 songs in there. And they change, you know, they, but there's some that are always going to be there. And then other ones kind of shift. And then I have my original song Bible, Bible, the ones that I've written since the time I dove into this. And that's got about 60 in it. And so we recorded 25 for the Chop House and then finished 12. Um, but as much color and, um, you know, like authenticity as possible. Uh, no cheating. Uh, everybody did the harmonies and the singing and the layers and the mandolin and the violin and all the things. You know, everybody play it right in front of you right now. Nobody cheating nothing right now. Can nail it for you. That kind of thing. So allowing myself to go to that place after having such rigid stuff with the other bands and having this free flowing wonderful um you know some songs without drums and stuff and cool shit you know like you actually hear everything that everybody's doing hear all the notes everybody's singing and some magical magical things so we're hoping to um i will get some help with that actually i think that i will look for some help with my next records the chop house record and if we decide to do newstead uh two then um I will look for some, you know, managerial help and some people in the right place so I can concentrate on my roles like I should. So that's what I've learned from all of that Newstead thing. And that, you know, really the reason that it kind of went under wasn't because of money as much as it was because of the load that I took on unknowingly, not trusting other people to speak for me, that kind of thing. Too much control, freaky shit, you know. It's funny to think about uh, Metallica. It, it it's one of the only bands I've ever seen in my life that has stuck with Q Prime the entire time, and you never hear about Q uh, Q Prime ripping off bands. You never hear that about them, which is pretty interesting, man. They are just so they've got to do a documentary on Q Prime because these Great. guys understand how to nurture talent from the streets all the way up, or even bands that were big and robbed from other management, take them on and show them how this is done right, you know? Very, very good point. Very good point. Yes, and, um, you know, they know what they can deliver. They're confident in that, and they expect you to do the same. And the people that they choose to go in with, it's like a team thing. Everybody within their camp votes on what bands, like new bands they're going to take on or whatever, they go out and see them and then they vote on Like I am willing, like we talked about before, about an hour ago, I am willing to put my time and miss my kids for a little bit because I know I'm going to get a cut of that. Okay? So I'll work for Muse, Metallica, Madonna, Cage the Elephant, the other seven top bands of the world because I know that I'm going to be able to get something from and I'm willing to put it in. And that's where they're at. You know, 40 how many ever years later? 50. Yeah. You know, back in the day, Cliff uh, Ten Nugent, early on, 72, 73, 74, Ten Nugent, ACDC way back then. I mean, incredible, incredible, incredible history. What a history, man. What a history. Yep. Yes, yes. Commendable. Yep. And still so cool. Still so cool. So respectful still. Oh, they're so nice, too, man. Like, I opened up, you know, they're like, you were up there doing comedy. That was wild. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good impersonation, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Right on, man. Yeah. What's your relationship now with Metallica? Do you ever talk to him at all? At all? Yeah, Lars and I stay in pretty good contact. Um, and he's always been really supportive with the art. Taught me a thing or two about it, you know, and now he really is. Yeah. I like it. You know, like he knows better and he says good, positive vibes kind of things. Um, I'm fans of his son's band, of his sons in general, you know, and I think they dig what I do. And so there's, that's a beautiful, another dimension of it all. 
Um, I still send the other guys birthday messages, you know, so it's, I would talk to them in person since, uh, probably since that 30th anniversary thing. Wow. Yeah. But Lars and I still keep in touch and he goes, he skis in Montana. And I think Nicole and his wife keep in contact about, you know, things, social media, something or other things I don't pay attention to, but, uh, yeah. So it's still, it's still positive there. You know, we, we are business partners for life. And um, I am only ever going to show respect. I'm only ever going to say good things about them. They offered me opportunity that I can incomparable, man, and I'll never forget it. So there's no way I'm ever going to say anything bad. With the art, it is interesting because uh, watching the Some Kind of Monster documentary, you see the art collection he had. And and uh, it's funny where I, I was turned on to art, starting back with the Appetite for Destruction album cover with Robert Williams and the juxtaposed yeah. oh painting yeah. of Todd Shore, Mark Ryden, and all of these, the Clayton brothers and all of this, you know, lowbrow art. Were you ever a fan of the lowbrow art and that style of painting with oil? Absolutely. Yes. And um, Joe Coleman, you know, once I started seeing that, that really, it, it helped me a lot um, with, with my things. I always like to use text within whatever layers happen. Uh, and he really helped me out with that that he's my favorite within all those cats i would say and still you know i i do every picture with both hands right and always try to do some kind of scratchy writing and so he just i don't know joe coleman had such a great um what do you call it insight to all this really creepy shit and able to translate it to you where it does not too scary but still holy crap because of the facts and the factoids that are within the picture, if you pay attention. Got to get out your magnifying glass to look at the picture, you know, to read everything. That's that's serious. I love that. I love that type of art. I love all types of art. You know, you go to the Louvre and you, you fall in love with that stuff. And, you know, you see the Mona Lisa in person. You're like, whoa, it's crazy small. Yeah. And you're like, that's crazy. <laughs> but everything is art in our lives. The album covers, uh, you know, as far as like, picture type of art, you know, billboards, uh, yeah. movie posters, everything, skateboard bottoms, every, mm. every, every kind of thing, art and design. I'm uh, obsessed with it, whether it be, uh, you know, whatever it is, architecture, like being into mid century and, and the furniture and everything. So it is interesting, uh, where you get inspiration, over or where you get turned on to it too. Maybe it's a, a Porsche 911, you know, any kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And it, and not everybody has those, um, you know, thoughts or understanding comprehension of lines or that. And I, I often wonder, you know, at the levels of, I guess, for lack of a better term, like clairvoyance, uh, like, you know, I'm sitting here looking at these clouds and I see the dog and a demon and a whatever childlike things do you do you allow yourself in your busy adult world in your busy adult life and all you're so in your screens and you're so important and all this shit do you allow yourself this kind of childlike wonderment to be able to get back to that place and so that's what i have found it does for me uh able to um dig all the way back there and there's no rules and it doesn't have to be in tune you know and, and it, it can't be wrong really it can't be wrong i mean be not good but it can't be wrong so you just go for it and make it happen. And the best, there's a couple really cool things that have come from it now that I've been in it for a while. Um, just go for it, not with any plan. Set all your tools up. Make sure that you can ha keep your momentum. And then there's the canvas. And whether it's this big or this big, sit back after you must go, go it for it, go it for it, go it for it, go for it. Music's going, go for it. Six hours, eight hours, ten hours later, step back, covered with fucking paint. Look at, oh, that was in me? Holy shit. And I, I would have never, unless it came out in that way to show itself what it's just hiding in there going, I'm going to be this fucking bird. You know, I would have known. How would I have known if I didn't go for it? And is everybody going to like it? No, no. Do I like it? Yeah, because it showed up. You know, it's kind of like a song, but not quite because song got to be in tune. You got to have some kind of plan where things relate to each other and shit in the painting and this kind of thing whether it's, you know, more abstracty like that, figurative, figurative, abstracty, it can be anything, you know, it can really be anything. So that's what I found in is that there's a purpose. There's a purpose in there when you see that or you can, can be entertained by your own 
abilities. Not everybody can get to that place where they allow themselves to respect their own abilities, appreciate their own abilities, especially today in the in, uh, internet and stuff where comparison kills the creativity, right? There's all these people, oh, they're doing better than me. If I would have had that back then, I don't know if I would have done that. I used to look over um, Scottsdale, Arizona, with the plots, the plots and guys, and it'd be two o'clock in the morning. I'd be done washing dishes somewhere and earning my keep and shit. And look, and I go, you know what? I know for a fact right now that the next two hours from quarter to two in the morning to 4.15, nobody's going to be playing bass like me. And any of these lights that I see, I know it. I fucking know it. Right? So that was a different thing that I built from as opposed to now where you have to always compare what's going to happen. So I'm not sure everybody has the chance to do that anymore. That's beautiful, man. That's, that, that's the truth. What, what, um, what would you tell me? Because, you know, there's so many people out there that just don't understand how the money has dwindled in the business. Tell me real quick, the difference of course, of the black album, CD, vinyl, everything, era of royalties, and the streaming now. It's super drastic, your checks that you get these days, right? The difference? Um, in the interim, from 03, 04 to maybe 12 or 13, considerably diminished. And depending on the territories, uh, Japan, Korea, Germany, where there was just all, all piracy only type of thing, that would be cut by 75 or 85%. So that was that's pretty serious. Um, but then we handled again once they got it kind of back in order and people have started to pay for things a little bit again. So it's it's fine again. Um, so the the money thing as far as that goes, when Metallica was hitting and from 1990 or 91 until 2001, the amount of 12 to 18 or 12 to 22 year old persons in all of the population of the 30 countries that made the world go round at that time, as far as concerts and music and things, that was all tangible, physical product. It was all records, cassettes, CDs, whatever it happened to be. Not everybody is caught up to our pace. People still at this moment, not everybody has a computer still, guys, okay? People still have cassette players only. People still only have vinyl. It's, a, it's still a giant fucking world, right? But back then, the amount of tangible product that could be sold and the cut that the band would get from that is what got us to where we could go and spend a bunch of money on a fun band. You know, that this this kind of thing that happened back then. It's not that way anymore. So you can get a little, a little bit here and a little bit there compared to what that was. Fortunately, Metallica has kind of defied all all predictions, all anything with all they've been able to last and still matter. And still have some relevance within the thing. I, oh, I was going to say, I'm back on another question. I forgot to say that to you. Is that uh, you were saying people are talking shit about, oh, they cut their hair. and You know, you know what? Those people, then God bless them. If you don't want to listen to this. There's a bunch of other bands. Please go listen to them and give them your money, right? Because today there was 100,000 people born that are going to listen to Metallica eventually. There's probably 380,000 or 390,000 born today, but 100,000 of those are eventually going to hear Metallica. And 20,000 of them are buying all the fucking records when they get to be 12. So, baby, 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 baby. <laughs> it is funny, too, because I will die on the hill on uh, always supporting Lars and, and anybody that shits on him. I immediately just clown them to their faces. And I, I'm glad that he battled for what he loved and the passion he has. And I'm glad that he was in Metallica and started Metallica and battled Napster or whatever he fucking did. I'm, I'm glad there's people out there that out there that have passion and and dig into what they believe, you know? Uh, anybody that says that is a fucking idiot. Yeah, okay. they uh, they they have no idea what they're talking about. Okay, the depth of this guy, right? His foresight, his comprehension of what the hell was going on when he was 21, 22, 23, when all of us were like, Ooh, you know, seriously. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's actually probably his comprehension was 12, but by the time he got to be 22 and he was with us or whatever, no, man, you don't, you don't have any idea what you're talking about. 
Okay, so if he can't play the same fill as Dave Lombardo or some tricky whoever the fuck you pick for today, so what? Look at the scoreboard, motherfucker. You know, there's no do not talk shit about that guy. He's way ahead of you in most things. I promise you that. I promise you. If we wouldn't have had him and his ability to uh, anticipate, to predict, to know uh, geography, to understand what country and what city and what did what at what time and all this stuff, man, has he led us through that? No way Metallic would be what they were. No way. Okay? So you need to you need to get a hold of yourselves because there's way more to it than just being able to hit a snare drum. In this in this world today, like you were to answer, keep answering your same question. Okay, the demand back when Jimmy Hendrix was playing or Black Sabbath started touring or whatever, the band came out, smoked some hash, played the songs, got paid a little bit, had some beers, chased a girl, went on their way, right? That filled their whole plate, filled their whole plate. If they have a there was a paranoid video that they agreed to do for one second. They put a bunch of oil behind him or whatever. That was, you know, there's no oh, a couple hours in this day now, or even shit, 20 some years ago or something, 30, perhaps that much of the play right there would be filled with the things we just spoke of. You learned your instrument, you play it in tune, you try to sing, you know what, remember what's coming next and all they memorize your shit. Okay. And then this chunk is the videos. And then this chunk is the interviews. And then that chunk is that thing. And then that chunk is that thing. That chunk is meetings. That chunk is lawyers. That chunk is depositions. That chunk is that. And then chunk, oh, and then you got that time for your wife. Fuck. You know, that that's what's real. So if anybody wants to talk about, oh, yeah, I got this. I could do that. Could you? Could you really? I don't think so, man. I don't Maybe for a week. Maybe for a week, you come back and start being crying to your mom and shit. You know? I, can, I can't even tell you how... Uh... How happy I am to talk to you, dude. It was uh, just an honor to have you on. And and once again, I want to thank uh, Bill Burr. I don't I don't know how it went down or the conversation. I don't know if you said, hey, I want to I want to do an interview. And he said, here, talk to this guy. I don't know what happened, but you just texted me out of nowhere and said, hey, got your number from Burr. Uh, I want to sit down and talk to you. And it was a great day for me because I was like, oh, man, this I can't tell you how much I love you're playing over all the years and your, your intensity and your work ethic, your tone and your fucking kindness too. Cause I know you don't remember me, but I remember you because you would put me on the list. You put my mom on the list or I'd be in the snake pit or we'd talk for a few minutes here and there and I'll never forget it. And I, I, um, I can't thank you enough, man. Very cool. Thank you. That's, that's very nice. Um, and Bill Burr, yeah, you know, a couple of years back, it's maybe six or something by now, I heard him on his podcast. He's talk about John Bonham. He's talk about drums and this kind of thing, right? I'm like, what's up with that? And I heard him say it again. And Nicole and I really enjoy him so much, you know. I'm like, you know what? I'm calling this fucker out. So I got through an agent and so and such. He got his number. And I call him, hey, dude, you want to jam? And he goes, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, because he didn't know what I meant. I don't think he knew what I was saying, you know, like, do you want to jam? Like, throw some shit down. Okay. So, all right, I'm going to come down to L.A., I'll get a place at SRL, uh, SIR. What drum kit do you want? Got him a drum kit set up, brought all my shit down, all my crazy shit, and set everything up and set him down. He, he walked across from Memphis family. It's like first season or something. And walks over like, what the fuck? And he sits down like, bro, right? I got the thing set up where it plays bass and guitar at the same time. So it's just fucking thing, right? And he's back there just trying to keep it going. He warmed up pretty good, though. And I got I got GoPro with the whole thing. And it's just, it was pretty great. Once he got loose and got going, it was fun. But fucking hey, that was the beginning, beginning of it all. And then we started going to his shows and we go backstage and he always has his drum kit, you know, on his rider backstage, right? So I always go and hang out and try to take a drummer or two with me when we go. So sit him down on his drum kit back and fuck him up a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's where it came from, though. And just we stayed friends through that time and kind of always been supportive of each other and, are, you know, looking out for each other's families or whatever, that kind of thing. But it's uh, become a good friendship. And look how got another blossom here. I hope to uh, see you face to face one day again. Uh, I'm always out on the road or if you're in L.A., please hit me up, man. Yeah. Let's do a thing. Let's let's play let's play some fucking Johnny Cash together. So I would love that. 
Oh, I would, do, I would do that in a minute. You know, I do that Bon Scott tribute, uh, you know, once a year or so. Yeah, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, first played and everything, but uh, for sure, the next one we do, you must play it. Wow, that's exciting in itself. Um, very cool. That's that's awesome. I'm glad we got to reconnect because you opened a bunch of portals, man. I could have went forever, and I got a little spacey in the middle there too because I was wanting to say so many things at once and I forgot. But oh no, man. Let's see. I get it, dude. Yeah. You're 60 years yeah. old. I'm 57. Hey, hey, I, easy now. No, I'm surprised we remember <laughs> shit because it is like when you live a life, it's hard to remember everything. You got pretty good memory on the dates and shit. But with me, it's like, oh, my God. I Oh, yeah, I did do that. You know, people are like, hey, I saw you here. And you're like, fuck, I forgot about that. You know, and you're, and you're, on, a, you're on a way bigger level, you know. Oh, one last question. One of my favorite things ever with Metallica was every year they would have these incredible leather jackets with the embroidery. My favorite one is the Justice with Dolores on the front. Do you still have those? Shit, what size are you? Uh, I wear like a medium or, you know, large. Hmm. <laughs> let me think about that. I got a, I got a stash in New York. Let me, let me check that out. Let me check that out for you. Um, yeah, I will. I'll, I checked that out. I know that was cool shit. Um, okay, so just want to make sure that all the people know, and if they're the metal fans or the J fans or whatever it is. So on Saturday, May 20th at Revolution Live in Fort Lauderdale, we're going to do an evening with Newstead. So it's Jesus Mendez Jr., Jesse Farnsworth, the original guys of our band. And then uh, Mike Newshock from Stain is with Stain. They got a new album and they're touring and everything. So he's not able to be with us. But I did some auditions kind of scoured the globe there a little bit for a second for a few weeks and found a guy from Caracas, Venezuela with his name, uh, Humberto Perez. And he's pretty scary. So, um, that's our four piece and we're going to play for a couple hours. Um, some old Newstead stuff, some brand new Newstead stuff, some motorhead songs, um, and some other surprises. I'm doing kind of a little bit of a biographical trip, almost like the first Metallica song I ever learned. The first song uh, I ever learned from a, the first concert I ever went to, this kind of shit, kind of blending everything in, but um, all bass and all vocal and all heavy. So there you go. Uh, that's so cool that you're doing that. And once again, yeah. man, that EP absolutely crushed. And uh, I'm, I'm I'm on board for anything you, you do, you know, so I hope that you do tour. I hope that you play L.A. one night and I can see that or New York or whatever, you know. And uh, like I said, I hope to see you face to face again, man. It was an honor to have you on. And like I said, man, it was great, great to see all those years up there. Just destroy it with Metallica, man. Thank you for the kind words. This has really been fun. I think we could probably go for a while. So I really appreciate it. And uh, let's do it again sometime. Oh, let's do it, man. For sure. hundred percent. We'll get you back okay. on and uh, let me know how the gig goes for sure. Okay, I will. Thank you. Thank you so much, man, for tuning in, everybody. That's Jason Newstead right there. Go see him if you're out in the Florida area. And uh, and then do yourself a favor and go put that Russia concert on or that fucking box set from the Justice, the binge and purge thing. You know, one of the greatest box sets with Seattle and, and uh, De uh, San Diego. That shit is just nuts. And um, and and celebrate Jason Newstead, man. The guy is uh, metal gold right there. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Appreciate that very much. Have a good one, everybody. Thanks, Dean. Candles lit, my man. Rock and roll. See ya.